What's up? I am Pastor Dallas Blacklock, um, better known as Pastor D or Pastor Dallas for most. And I am the lead pastor at First Mount Carmel Missionary Baptist Church, where we are the church with outstretched arms. Um, this is my story, and I hope you stay tuned in, you like it, because it goes pretty deep. And uh, it truly glorifies God and not myself. Uh, but this is my story. I'm born and raised right here in Houston, Texas, from the south side of Houston, Texas. Uh, I am 40 years old, man. Next week I'll be 41 years old, so it is a blessing. Uh, growing up, life was hard. Life was a struggle. Uh, growing up in southeast Houston wasn't um, uh, what some people would believe the most uh, opportunity, the, the, the greatest opportunities weren't, weren't, weren't presented for those of us who grew up in that area. However, uh, I had a great mother and my mother was able to uh, persevere through some, some trials and persevere uh, through some, some hardships in her life and able to move us out of that area and being able to move us over to Southwest Houston where we thought was better, but yet it still still came with these obstacles and things that I had to overcome. But uh, that's where I'm from. Uh, I love this city. Uh, I have a passion for this city, passion for the inner city. And uh, that's why I do what I do, because of where I come from. And sometimes where you come from brings about uh, your strength. And, and, and I truly look at that being my strength, where I come from. Uh, so I grew up playing sports. It's just what you do in the hood, right? You grow up, you play ball, you play sports. And uh, growing up, this is what I thought was going to be my ticket out. Um, I was always kind of a hidden nerd. I was the guy that was reading books and when nobody else was watching. I was reading books and... In, in class when other people was reading sports magazines. Uh, but truly I figured that I was gonna be the next uh, Michael Jordan or Gary Payton, you know, just to come out of the hood. And then unfortunately, I uh, stopped growing, <laughs> stopped growing. So uh, I started to look at other avenues, but I was, I was introduced to a, um, a guy by the name of Lewis Morris who um, found me one day. I mean, truly found me. When I say found me, I was still in concrete. Uh, I was still in concrete trying to be able to, to create uh, a base for my basketball goals. I was that committed to wanting to get, become a better basketball player. And so he saw me still in this concrete and then from that moment on, at that particular moment, should I say, uh, he began to minister to my life and began to tell me that that was something greater for me than what I was looking at. Uh, told me that sports uh, wasn't going to be my ticket and that I had other opportunities in life. Uh, I thought I was going to be a football player as well. And then he also mentioned to me that what the NFL really stands for and what it really stands for is not for long. And so uh, I started to look at things from a different perspective. I started honing in my skills on academics, uh, but it was sports that allowed me to uh, get an education. Uh, so that pushed me into church. And I started going to church at 12, right? Um, 12 years old, having this dream, having this dream of preaching in front of all of these people and not knowing where this is gonna take me. And so I'm like, yo, like this is, I don't know what this means. I don't know what this is supposed to do. And here I, here I am now at 15 years old and I'm announcing my calling to preach. And so I'm a 15 year old teenager in the 10th grade that is preaching this first sermon. Um, I remember that day like it was yesterday, Daniel 6, uh, Daniel in the Lions Den, don't ever give up. That was my first sermon. Uh, but I knew then that this is what I was called to do. From, from that day moving forward, I knew that I wanted to go to college and I wanted to go to seminary, I wanted to preach. And that's what I did, I went to college and I studied philosophy and religion, played ball in college. Uh, and I knew I was on my way back to Houston because by that time I had had a son. I know what some of you are thinking, like, wow, like, hold on, I thought you were preaching. Well, yeah, that's something what the church people said as well. Because I was a good boy. I was the one who wasn't supposed to screw up. I was the one that was never supposed to mess up. But here I am at 17 years old, I got a son boy. And I'm preaching. Don't add up. You don't understand that. You don't understand Baptist church. <laughs> you don't understand the traditional church. So it was hard. Uh, I was set down. I was told that I, I wouldn't be able to preach. And uh, crush me. Because here I am, this person who is young, new to the faith. But now I'm being told that I can't exercise the gift that God has given me because I made a mistake. Not that my son was a mistake, but because I had done something that was um, not pleasing to uh, the society and the culture of man. Long story short, uh, I, 
I knew I was coming back to Houston, but I wanted to go to seminary. So I'm driving uh, to Indiana, going on my way to seminary, uh, and literally, I had a flat. On the road, flat, two, two o'clock in the morning, and I know then that was God's sign that this is not for you. I have something greater for you. Took that journey back to Houston, and, uh, and that's kind of where my journey started to take off when it comes to uh, ministry. And then that's when the game, the coaching came. Then I just knew I was going to be a coach. Man, I said, this is it. This is my avenue. This is my platform. This is what God has given me. This is my opportunity to impact young men. I went through what I went through so that I can be able to show them how to be able to overcome struggles. The Bible tells us that uh, I write to you young men because you are strong. You overcome the evil. And that's what I, I knew I wanted to do. I wanted to be able to overcome the evil. So I started coaching. I was pouring my all into it. I coached AAU basketball. I coached seven on seven football. I coached track. I coached softball. I did everything that I could because this was my pulpit. This was my platform. It impacted a lot of young people's lives. Many of the kids went to college. 29 years old, I was blessed to become a head football coach at the same high school that I graduated from. Become the head football coach and life for me changed. Uh, I really gained the uh, pulpit and gained the platform that I, I needed to exercise my gift. I knew then that this is where I was. I was supposed to be in leadership. I was supposed to be uh, in management. I was supposed to be a steward. And so I found myself uh, spending all of my time uh, pouring into young men. And that was it. That was when I knew I had found it. Then God started turning things. Now I moved from high school, now I get this I get an opportunity to go to college. What? Okay, God, you're moving. I see it. But you go to college and you're going to take a $30,000 pay cut. Come on. It's supposed to be a blessing, right? A blessing's supposed to come with increase. Why is this blessing decreasing? And so here I am now. I'm going to college. I went to University of Houston to coach football and work on their staff. But I'm being told that I'm going to have to take a pay cut. Okay, God, this is where you're taking me. I'll go. I go to University of Houston, work my way back up. I right, salaries moved back up. Then God says, you know what? It's time for you to get back on the football field. Because at first I was just on the staff, I was in recruiting. But I knew I wanted to gain that platform back. And the position came open at Texas Southern University. I said, this is it. I'm going to TSU. I'm a coach. I get this opportunity back. You of H made a counter offer offered me $30,000 more. So here it is again. I'm taking a $30,000 pay cut. And I'm telling myself, my like, God, why is it that it seems like in order for me to gain the, the prominence that I need, it's, gonna, it's taking so much of a price. Sometimes that's what separates leaders from those who can't lead. Is most people don't want to pay the price. And so I moved into this role at Texas Southern. And uh, from there, God started to move again, right? I'm, I'm there and I'm, I'm going through it now. My marriage is on the rocks. Football is taking off. Ministry is suffering. I don't know what to do. I'm caught. Now I've been in the marriage for 15 years and uh, the marriage is now coming to an end. Come on, man, God. Like, how is this happening? How are you getting to this point where it seems as though you're failing? So I'm in a broken state. But I'm coaching, I'm preaching, I'm teaching, I'm, I'm mentoring, I'm doing all these things, but yet it's still, I'm still broken. But that's the greatness of God, right? Because you can still be a blessing still, while you're broken. And God saw me in a place that I had to go through because... I had to be able to share this testimony with somebody else. So there it is, 2019, I get a divorce. Life itself seems like it's, it's now starting over. I meet a beautiful young lady, I start to date. My life seems to be almost resurrected. Uh, 
shortly after we fall in love. And here it is. Now I'm getting married all over again. I know you probably think like, man, it's crazy. Yeah, I said I would never do it again. <laughs> but here I am getting married again. And it's a beautiful thing because now I finally find someone who truly shares the passion that I, I share. Somebody truly uplifts me. Somebody truly carries me. That's, true. That's that help me. Then it starts to grow. Things are looking good. Things are looking great, better than good. Things are looking great. We get the engagement, buy the fat rock, we get ready to do this, everything's going good. We get ready to purchase a house, all these things are working. So we say, cool, we're gonna move into the house on July 3rd. We move into the house July 3rd. <laughs> Three weeks later, my dad dies. Again, Lord, how am I keep getting blessed, but I keep, I keep losing. So every time I gain, it seems like I'm losing. Work through, never got a chance to grieve. Uh, just got to keep going. That's what life is. You got to be hard, you got to be tough, you got to be able to move forward. Uh, but I thank God that God was able to uh, grant me grace for the place. He granted me grace for the place that I was in in my life. And so because of that, it was so many things, so many people were there to be able to uh, surround me and give me the balance that I needed. December. That was in July. It was December. And my mom passed. <laughs> Hit me. Like a ton of bricks. It's my rock. It's my everything. This is my rise and shine. I mean, this is my, my fishing buddy. This is my movie partner. This is everything. Now she's gone. Then I got a chance to preach the funeral. And I preached the funeral. And that same vision that I told you about before, when I had, when I was 12 years old, about me standing in front of this crowd and I'm preaching, was revealed to me. At that moment, I saw it. That vision. And when I was 12, it was me preaching my mother's funeral. Tough. But in the process, again, God grants me grace. I preached my mom's funeral on Saturday. My wife's uncle died, did his funeral on Monday. On Tuesday, the pastor at my church tells me he's retired. And I want you to take over. It's crazy. This is what I'm thinking in my mind. Like, whoa, this is too much. Like, it's happening too fast. We have a meeting on Wednesday. Friday, I walk in and tell my boss, uh, I'm done. I don't know how much money I'm gonna make. Um, I don't know what my insurance is gonna be like. I don't know if I'm gonna have dental. I don't know if I'm gonna have life insurance, any of these things. But Friday, I done. So again, to gain in my life it takes loss. Not knowing where I'm going, not knowing which way I'm going, but I know this is the path that God has taken me on because God had already shown it to me when I was a youth. From there, I become the lead pastor at First Mount Missionary Baptist Church. And the rest is history. <laughs> So, um, when it's time for me to stand and deliver, um, it's always me going to, uh, to the worship table. That's what I call it, right? I'm not going there to study. I'm not going there to try to plan and uh, knock out some sermon, but it's, it's me going to the table and me worshiping. And so, whenever I'm there, it's always God first speaking the word to me. Never me going there to deliver something that's, that I'm just supposed to give to somebody else. But God always preaches the word to me first. So I'm already convicted. So I don't believe that, that I can stand before God's people and not truly have digested and taken the word to heart for, for myself. So for me, I, I think my style um, differs from a lot of people. And I'm not trying to be pretty. I'm not trying to be flashy. I'm not trying to... I'm not trying to hoop, I'm not trying to sing, because I can't sing. Uh, I don't have no tune in me, I'm not about to do all that. <sighs> none, of, none of that stuff, right? 
I just feel like God has called me to be real, uh, to really truly be able to be transparent. And I feel like people respect transparency. People need to see transparency because there's so many people out here that are skeptics. You go back into the Bible, we even look at uh, who we call Doubting Thomas. Skeptic. So it's my, my goal, my intent, every time that I'm, I'm standing for the people of God to be transparent. Uh, even in, in the Bible, it talks about Doubting Thomas or it talks about Thomas. Um, he asked Jesus to see the, the holes in his hands. And that was Jesus' moment to be transparent, to be truly vulnerable for all of those even who were skeptics to be able to believe. And so if Jesus was able to be transparent, then that's what we're called to. I'm always preaching love because to me, if you, the Bible is a huge love story. That's where we want to go. That's, that's what we have to get back to. We've seen enough prosperity sermons. We've seen enough hooping and hollering. We've seen enough theatrics. It's enough of that, man. I mean, I, I, I think we've seen enough um, of preachers, uh, ministers who, who get up in front of people and, and put on a show. I think people are now looking for the real church. I think the harvest is great. The labor is a few. I think um, the harvest is ripe right now, you know, and people want to make sure that they're receiving something that's genuine, something that's authentic, and something that they can take with them. Uh, I think people are ready to be educated. They're tired of being entertained. I think people need uh, not only healing for their, their emotion, but people need healing for their soul. And so that's what I truly believe that God has given me. He's given me the authenticity to be real with people. Uh, no, it may, it may not sound as, as, as oratorical as, as most other preachers and more as rhythmic as Dr. Martin Luther King, but I thank God that it's me. And I'm humbled by it because it's, it's uh, something that I was, wasn't able to do. Probably saying like, what you mean? Well, in my story, from the age of one, when I was able to have a word that came out of my mouth all the way until I was high school, man, I stuttered. Words couldn't come out of my mouth. I would be embarrassed because I would uh, stutter in front of people, stutter in front of girls, stutter in front of the boys. And now here I am, this stuttering little boy is now preaching to God's people. So for me, I, I take it as, uh, as, a, as a true privilege every time that I'm able to stand and deliver God's message because I know for a fact that it's, it's not it's not anything that I did, but it's God that's speaking through me. Right, so, I'm a real dude. You know, most people will tell you, oh, you know, I, when they figure something out, that they planned it all along. Now, I can be honest and tell you, like, I was the oblivious uh, and illiterate when it came to social media. Tried it, Twitter, tried Instagram, Facebook. Uh, and I sucked at it. I didn't even know how to post. I didn't know how to post comments. Uh, so I had, Inst not Instagram, I had TikTok. I had TikTok on my phone. My daughter grabs my phone like, Dad, when did you get TikTok? When did you get TikTok? You don't even know anything about TikTok. So I'm, I'm the old dad who's lame or whatever the case is. And I don't have any posts. I don't have any friends. And so she takes my TikTok. She sets it up, puts things into my phone for me. Um, and then she comes home one day and was like, Dad, we ought to try something. And I said, what you want to try? She was like, I want to just catch you preaching. Just, I want to I just pick out something you just preaching. And I was like, all right, you know, let's do it. And so she was like, we're going to call it Popcorn Preach. And I was like, why are we calling it Popcorn Preach? She said, just like when you're in class, like when the teacher asked you to just popcorn out and just say something. And I said, all right, let's do it. So calling the popcorn priest, she just starts picking out objects, right? So she picks out uh, this object. I'm washing dishes. Literally, we want to do this and make it as authentic as possible. So um, she catches me off guard. And she catches me off guard. She says, hey, dad, popcorn priest. So now we got this thing where anytime she says, 
hey dad, popcorn priest, whatever I'm doing, wherever I'm at, I stop and start preaching on the spot. For me, it wasn't uh, difficult because when you grow up in Houston, everybody knows when you grow up in Houston, you grow up and you freestyle. So to me, that's what it was. It was like, a, I'm freestyling. I'm preaching, but I'm freestyling. And so I took that challenge of it. And so first thing she does is she said, Dad, look at this, this candle. I go, popcorn preach the candle. And I start popcorn preaching the candle. And I look at the candle and I say, oh, this candle is a light. And all of us have the light. We're the light of the world. But if you look closely at the candle, the candle has a lid on it. So too many people in our lives have, have lights, but they're hiding their light. And God is saying, take the lid off. Because there's so many people that need to see your light. So many people that, that need to see you shine. Boom. I was like, whoa. This is... She was like, Dad, that was good. I was like, ah. You know, kind of freak out about it. Boom. Posted it. Got a few hits. A few people liked it. Followers started going up. And we kept posting. Before you knew it started taking off. Like I'm posting it on now Instagram, I'm posting it on, on Facebook. Uh, more people are saying they like it. People are uh, sending comments saying, hey, you know, we love the popcorn priest, we love the popcorn priest, keep it up, keep it going. Uh, and then my oldest daughter jumps in and said, Dad, you gotta find an algorithm. Like, algorithm? <laughs> What's the algorithm? She said, Dad, you gotta find an algorithm. You gotta, you gotta post at a certain time. You gotta post uh, a, a certain amount of times a week. And then once you do it often, they start being on the FYP. Well, what is an FYP? She said, Dad, that's a For You page. I'm like, oh, okay. So still oblivious to it. So we keep posting, and all of a sudden, we posted one that really took off. And we posted the one about the license plate. And it took off. We got 10,000. It was 12,000. It was going up every day, going up every day. And people were really taking a liking to it. So we was like, oh, my God. My daughter was like, Dad, we're going viral. I was like, what? She said, Dad, look at your phone. We're going viral. And so it's, it's, it starts climbing up. We're at 16, 17,000 views, uh, 500, 600 likes, 200 shares. Like, and it really does start to go viral. So, uh, of course, more of the uh, followers start happening. But you know, we kind of stuck at that little plateau. Then I, I do one and I post it on a Monday morning. And this one, she came up to me and she was like, Dad, we're not gonna pick an item this time. This time I want you to go off the dome. So I'm like, okay. And then I'm going out, taking the trash out. She catches me coming back from the trash game, like, boom, popcorn preach. Off the dome. And I'm like, ah. So I popcorn preach off the dome and uh, it really took off. I mean, it went viral. Now, 50, 60, 75,000 people have viewed it. And we're like, oh my God, can't believe this is taking off. But the thing that it was, it was people were being ministered to. Man, so many people were saying how it blessed them. So many people were saying how it helped them. And that's when we knew we got to keep going. Because people all over the country were chiming in and people all over the country were saying how this has been a blessing to them. And that's when I realized then that God was speaking to me and saying, your vision is a little too small. And that's something greater on the other side of this. We, we did another one. We were at the church. They were doing some repairs at the church. And she said, Dad, let's do a popcorn preach at the church. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm in church. This is my, I'm in my domain. This is it. I'm, you know, let's go. Not, not knowing what she's going to do. Then she she says to dad, popcorn preach. I'm getting ready to sit down. And she said, popcorn preach the exit sign. And I popcorn preach the exit sign. And literally, if you watch the video, the Holy Spirit just comes in and takes over. Post the video, fit the algorithm, and it literally blew up. Five, six hundred. Now to 700,000 views. That's 36,000 followers, but you are the, the people that came pouring in asking for prayer. People who have been uh, thinking about committing suicide. People who are leaving marriages. People who've been abused. People who are, have lost their children. 
so many people have been uh, uh, going through, so many people have been blessed by this. And it all started with just a little father and daughter, just a little joke, a little game we were playing. But it truly showed the intentionality of God. It shows that God was in this thing all along. And now that we're seeing it grow, now we can be able to truly start ministering to those people. So now when I speak it, now when, you know, she says popcorn preach, now we take it not only as a, uh, some fun for us to do, to be able to, co to cultivate our relationship, father and daughter, who my daughter, I, I call her a genius, right? She, she, she does all, she actually, funny thing is, she records the videos, she puts in all the hashtags, saves them on my phone, tells me when to post them. She does it all. She's a creative genius behind it all. And so, but now we know that it's something greater. And so now she tries to put me in a position where we find these, the most obscure objects. And that's what we find really helps people. Because it's those things that people see in ordinary, everyday life. And to be able to see Jesus in ordinary things is absolutely extraordinary. So I truly believe that there is a, a Bible character, uh, if we want to call him a Bible character, that truly resonates with who I am, with who God has called me to be. Story of my life. And I look at Joshua and I see myself. Because here I am, this young man, who've been taken through the wilderness and I've seen all the things that the older people who have come before me, I've seen what Moses has done. And now God is calling me to succeed Moses. And just like Joshua, here I am, I'm afraid. I don't know if I can do this. hear God saying to me the same way he said to Joshua, be strong, be courageous. He says it again, be strong, be courageous. He says it again, be strong, and be courageous. Then he says, it's just like I was with Moses, so will I be with you. So I'm empowered by that. To know that whatever I face, that God is with me. He then goes on to tell Joshua that wherever your feet step, hmm, wherever your feet trod, whatever land that you step on, that's the land that you will possess. And that's where I am right now. And I think that's where a lot of people are, if I can truly be honest. We're in that position sometimes where now we're getting ready to receive the promise and, and the promise is almost there and it seems like it's hard and it seems like you're getting there, but it's, it's hard and it's pressing and you gotta cross over this river, you gotta cross over that, you gotta endure this, and now you're getting there. Now, you, as soon as you get across the promise, then what you think is your end now becomes your beginning. What you think is your winning shot. It's just the beginning of the game. Because now what you understand is, is to possess something means now that you got something that's required of you. Ooh, that's good. Something that's required of you because now God does the conquering. Mm, like that. God does the conquering, but now you got to do the driving out. And that's where I was. That's where I see, see Joshua as being myself because just like God gave him the promised land, it was still up to him to be able to drive out. And so as God does the conquering, if you got to do the driving. And so therefore, that's what I'm doing right now. Every obstacle that comes against me, I'm driving. All the broken pieces, I'm putting them back together and I'm driving. All the pain that I've experienced in my life, I'm putting it out of the way and I'm driving. And no demon, no hell, no, no person can ever come against me because I know what God has called me to do. And that's just be obedient. You know what that looks like. It looks like you walking around Jericho. <laughs> it looks like you marching around Jericho. Don't say nothing. Don't 
don't say a word. Just keep walking. In your obedience, you'll hear the voice of God. And on that seventh day, on the seventh time, God said, shout. see in my life right now. I see walls all around me, man. They're coming down. I can rejoice. I can sing. I can shout. Because I know it wasn't anything that I did. But it was all because of his grace. He received the glory. So, that's me. In a nutshell, uh, Pastor D. Again, First one called Missionary Baptist Church. We are the church without stretch arms. You can follow us uh, right now on YouTube. That's why all of our videos are there on YouTube. C-W-O Houston, C-W-O-A stands for Church Without Stretched Arms. C-W-O Houston, you can follow us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook, same thing, C-W-O Houston. Follow us on Instagram, C-W-O Houston. If you want to follow me personally on TikTok, uh, it's Pastor Dallas underscore uh, to follow me on TikTok. So, uh, that's how we can stay connected. Um, I'm praying for you. Be praying for me. And we're going to grow together.